In this episode, we talk about Huify's take on inbound, average height of Jesus and what that might have been, how to leverage your time on Instagram when you're spending an hour a day leveraging that platform, and how to build a community around a common interest, what platform to, to use, and how to grow that. Alex asks, how do you explain inbound marketing and who if I special approach to it? Great question, Alex. Inbound marketing. So this is definitely one of those terms that's become a buzzword in the industry. And just like content marketing, it's like, what exactly does that mean? What's exactly the approach, all that. So inbound marketing is a methodology that hinges on four principles, attracting people, converting people, closing them, and then delighting them once they become customers. The reality is in between converting and closing, there's a lot of steps, a lot of things that take place. That in itself is a huge part of the sales process or the sales funnel. So there's a lot more that could be there. How we approach it is we focus everything from the bottom of the funnel up. Meaning we wanna make sure when we start working with someone that if one of their sales guys goes out tomorrow, they could bring in customers potentially within the next couple of days because they were equipped with the right information. They knew what to say, they knew what to do, and they knew how to categorize it or how to make sure they could keep track of it within their CRM or whatever other tools they're using to keep track of where everyone is in the process. Once you start there, then you move on from, okay, so the salespeople know how to sell, they know how to track that then how do we make sure that when leads come in, they are handed off correctly between marketing and sales? So how do I make sure that sales, the sales team is getting the proper notifications, getting everything else so they can jump on it right away and respond in a very time efficient manner? We typically respond under five minutes. When someone comes in as a lead, we try to call them within five minutes of receiving that inbound lead. Therefore, because of that short time frame, we need to make sure that we're on top of the ball. We've got a really good notification system set up and we have enough time to get the notification, do a little bit of research on the lead and then hit it hard. Once you go from there, then you start to go up the funnel. Okay, now that we've got the handoff process, what does it look like for us to actually capture leads? Do we have the appropriate resources on the site to get the right leads? Are we trying to give out guides that aren't really as relevant? Do we have guides that are still top of, top of funnel? They're still high level guides that are attractive enough? Or are we trying to use a download to sell someone on our product? It's probably, they're probably not ready for that yet. They're just becoming a lead. Really, content doesn't sell. Salespeople sell. Now, a lot of this we're talking about in a complex fashion. Obviously, you could raise your hand and be like, whoa, what about this industry? And what about this industry? And I'm sure there's many exceptions to the rule. However, across the board, if you are selling something that's complex, if you have a software product that's difficult, if it takes you two or three minutes to explain what you do, it's probably complex. So you can't expect a guide, a piece of paper, to communicate very actively what it is you do and the value that it brings to a customer and assume that that's gonna close the customer. Therefore, you use the guides as a way to start the conversation so then you can tailor it to that individual and structure it in a way that they would understand it, they would appreciate it, they would value it, so then they can start to realize, okay, this is why I really need to work with this company or you know, this is how I can relate because I have these similar problems or whatever else. So once you have those guides in place, then you gotta figure out how are we able to market these guides? How are we able to market these landing pages that are on our site, these forms that are on our site to convert people? And that's where blog articles, social media, email, even advertising can come into play. A lot of inbound marketers will say, whoa, advertising is outbound, never do it. It's like, well, if it's done correctly, you can actually use advertising to guide people to the content a lot faster than hoping that they discover it themselves. So that's a quick overview of the inbound process. Obviously that's tailored differently to every single customer we work with. We kind of take that process and lay it over each client partner and depending on what areas are sticking out the most that need the most assistance with, those are the areas we focus on. But typically we're starting from the bottom of the funnel and working our way up to the top. 
Hey, Josh, thanks for, t- thanks for taking my, my question. Um, I'm really trying to push Instagram with my social media, and I'm not looking for a quick, cheap hack. What I'm looking for is the best way for me to use my time. So say I'm going to commit an hour of my time per day to work on Instagram. What's the best way to use that time? Is it going and liking other people's things, going and comment on other people's things? Just uh, let me know what you think. Thanks. Bye. Roman, another great question. Very, very good. So basically, where should you spend your time and why and how when you're focusing on an individual platform? An hour a day, that's awesome. That's so cool that you get to dedicate that amount of time to that. I would say you should focus the most on what you think is going to provide you with the most value within that platform. As far as techniques, I will get to that in a minute. But what I mean by that is what will provide you with the most value is Figure out how to set it up so you can drive people back to what you want them to see. If you're using Instagram as a way to hire people, that's how we use it internally here. We use Instagram to show off our culture, to show off our company, so then we can draw people in. And then the only link that's available on the Instagram page is our jobs, our careers page. So our focus is to do that, is to show off our company. So we don't spend as much time actively pursuing others Um, If we did, we would focus on where are areas, where are pockets that very motivated individuals are because that's the type of people we want to hire. So the inverse is also true. If you're trying to focus on drawing people to your company to hire you, then you should focus on where are pockets where they are, how can I start fostering conversation on other people's content that they're already viewing, so inside the comments, they can find some of the comments that I'm saying, and you can start having conversations with those people so they will go back from those pockets that already exist onto your content where you can have some of the information that you're reaching. So I would say if you're spending an hour a day, I would break it up. I would spend a third of the time going out to other people's content, OPC. If you watched, check out one of my latest videos that went up on my YouTube. I talk about a tool that utilizes OPC, other people's content, really, really well. So check it out. If you spend your time going on other people's content, commenting, continue to jump back in that thread and have conversations with people that are there. That'll help you build up your audience a lot faster because you're leveraging that conversations that's, that, the conversations that are already happening on that thread to then draw people back to your stuff. You'll have to gauge on how active uh, of threads you want to join. If it has a ton of comments, you're probably going to get lost in the shuffle and it's going to be hard for people to see even what you tag them in. If you can find something that has a good medium of interesting topics, fair amount of comments, but isn't overwhelmed with comments, then that'd probably be a good place to start. The other third, I would just go inside their accounts and interact on people's photos. You know, comment, like, start dialoguing with them. Don't just say nice photo every single time, go a little bit deeper. And then for the last third, I would focus on analyzing your own feed, analyzing what's working, what's not, start following a lot of people and kind of test and see what works. Great question and awesome use of Anchor. I am madly in love with that app. We're probably going to dedicate a whole video to that very soon. Ross asks, my question is over under height of Jesus. Do you think he is taller or shorter than six foot three? Oh, Ross. Let's see here. So if you're not following Ross, St. James, St. James is his Twitter. I highly suggest it. You definitely won't regret that follow. Uh, He puts out a lot of interesting content. His question alone probably hints on the value of the content that he puts out and how funny and entertaining it can be. So, um, height of Jesus. You know, Ross, to be honest, I don't exactly know. However, here are a couple of things I do know. As a people, the Israelites tend to be a little bit shorter. And back then, they tend to also be shorter across the board. You'll hear different comments in the Old Testament. Obviously, Jesus happened right before the New Testament. But you'll hear comments in the Old Testament about a land of giants, and it'll give sizes. And sometimes when you really read into the text, you realize that these giants weren't really like people that are 15 feet tall, like we might think of when we hear the word giants today and we think about it in old times, but rather they were around like nine, you know, seven to nine feet, which is still a giant in my book. But when you think about it that way, you start to realize and you hear that these people were twice the size of the Israelites. You realize, okay, they were probably 
they were probably around five foot, you know, if not even under five feet. So I, if I had to wager and guess, I would say that Jesus was actually shorter than we would typically imagine because of the average height of the Israelite people at that time. If you've got any thoughts or if you know the right answer to that question, I am very interested. So please feel free to post something in the comments below. Carolina Patriots ask, what's the best social media channel for building a community around a common interest? Good question. This is tough. It really depends on what your audience is already doing. You know, if for an example, I wanted to reach a bunch of CPAs and I wanted to build a community on around a common interest of accounting, that's going to limit my uh, social media accounts that I'm going to focus on. Across the board, as far as growing an audience and growing interaction, Snapchat has been crushing it for me recently. I have some of the best connections and the best conversations I've ever had with people on Snapchat right now. And yes, I'm talking about business. I'm not talking about other things that the old scary man in media has put out over the years about what Snapchat is for and is, and is not for. Um, I had a perfect example. I had one of our one of my good connections ask for a business reference, talking a full long amount of text through Snapchat. And that's when it dawned on me, wow, Snapchat isn't just for playing around anymore. It is definitely can be used for business. It's an awesome tool. But that's Snapchat. I would say right now, Anchor really is a cool one you should check out. Anchor is basically Snapchat meets podcasting. So it's a very short snippet podcasting form. It launched yesterday, so this is super relevant. Um, it's a huge early growing community that is continuing to add many, many members every single minute. And there's a lot of really cool conversations that you can get in now and you can search by hashtag, you can search by username or whatever to find really meaningful discussions. One of my favorites is one that I was able to get involved with that talked about what's the future gonna look like. And there's a lot of really good answers that went in depth about how even though things that are on demand now provide a lot of convenience, how that actually might provide more freedoms down the road. Or with the advanced technology of things like Hyperloop or Uber or, or basically the streamlining of transportation, that's gonna actually allow people to reach further out beyond what they used to. So they're gonna be able to expand and do a lot more with the time that they have. Therefore, spend more time with family. Therefore, spend more time doing what they want to on vacationing, experiencing more life, and maybe even being more active versus what delivering on demand, people working from home may communicate a less active uh, Wally -E or Ready Player One lifestyle where people just live and <laughs> work from their, the, the safety of their homes and they never leave. Thanks so much for watching. I really enjoy doing this video series. It's great to hear some of the questions that you all have. I cannot do this video series without you though. So please ask more questions on Instagram, on Twitter, or in the comments below this video on YouTube. That'll be really helpful for us to be able to find your questions. We wanna make sure that no question gets overlooked, but please continue to ask those questions so that way we can feature you on our next episode.